All right, well, this will be the uh, last question then for tonight. Um, let me preface this with uh, quoting from that Russian-Ukrainian naturalist Vladimir Vernadsky. Uh, in 1925, Vernadsky, then living in France, wrote the following. He said, man is profoundly distinguished from the other organisms by his action on the environment. This distinction, which was great from the very beginning, has become immense with the passage of time. The action of other organisms is almost exclusively determined by their nutrition and their physical growth and increase. Mankind certainly acts in the same way as all of these organisms, but his mass is completely negligible in comparison with the totality of living matter, and the direct manifestation and living nature of his nutrition and physical increase are almost nothing. Reason changes all. Through it, man utilizes material in the environment, inanimate or living, not only for the building of his body, as other life does, but also for social life. And this usage has become a great geological force. Thought, by its existence, introduces into the earth a powerful process having no analog before the appearance of man. So this writing in 1925, this is the beginning of the noosphere, the understanding, at least him putting it down in writing, the understanding from a geological standpoint of the action of human thought on our planet. And that's the subject for this final question to you. Currently, as you know, our scientific research team, the basement, is currently developing a powerful reworking of the North American Water and Power Alliance, a project originally proposed in the 1960s to bring water from Alaska and Canada into the parched southwest in northern Mexico. Our re-envisioning of NOAPA includes the use of nuclear power, which would nearly double the amount of water available for distribution, a better understanding of atmospheric water flows to comprehend the recycling of water through living processes, and the potential of weather control systems to distribute atmospheric moisture in the best possible way. Viewed in this light, NOAPA leads in the development of more than an economic recovery, it kickstarts a whole new economy. The upcoming report we're working on states that our economic troubles cannot be solved by slow means, but by a major leap towards thermonuclear fusion. To many economists, embarking on such a huge project at a time of economic distress might seem counterintuitive. What's wrong with their thinking? Well, they're covered their cowardice has run ahead of their brains. You know, this is the truth. I mean, uh, we've, you know, I've been living for a number of years, and in the course of my living, I've had some experiences, especially as I entered into adulthood, more particularly, and became a consultant in terms of forecasting, economic forecasting. I became one of the most successful economic forecasts in the period, but we say, well, how does that happen? Well, it's a natural thing that the human being has the potential inherently, if it's developed properly, to be able to actually foresee the future. Now, this is not some miracle where somebody comes in with a magic wand and throws, does a trick for you. It's based on your ability to actually think through, for on the basis of your exposure to society, to think through where society is going. You have all these elements around that you can consider. And it, it shows you where society is going to tend to go. B because you have an experience of mankind. Mankind is not, is not an unknown quantity. It may be for some people. But for those of us who are serious, it is not an unknown quantity. So you just have to piece your thoughts together and look ahead and go through some experience of experimenting. How can I, how can I adduce from this set of facts that that is going to happen? Nothing magical about it. But the problem, most people are trained and conditioned to limit themselves to what they have experienced up to this moment. And forecasting means, if it's competent, means you are able to foresee what you could not have experienced at that moment. Because you, what you get, you get an understanding of the process of humanity. All kinds of life and so forth. The very life itself gives it to you. Huh? The very experience of how life works. 
And what you have is you don't have little pieces of clues. Huh? What you have is a composite of the way things come together, the way they work together. Huh? And you look at things, certain disturbances that are going on in this process. You find so what is causing that disturbance? Why doesn't it work the way it should work? Huh? So you get this combination. I mean, it's like I, my most successful one was night, you know, was in uh, the summer, but actually in, in, in December second of you know, th that year, when I had this great debate uh, on this question of forecasting, and I had the pleasure of wiping these guys out on, in that debate. Right. And but it's the same kind of thing. You you have a certain knowledge from experience and from insight as to how things work. And you can now, you can instead of just saying, here's a little thing, is it going to do this or is it going to do that? No, that's not your answer. The answer is, do you know, do you understand your society well enough to understand what this combination of symptoms is leading you to? And then something clicks in your mind, ah, that's how it works. And then you, have, then you, have a, you can make a fairly precise forecast. And that is what has been lacking because it's discouraged. Because, because of the banking system, the way the banking system is developing. The, these guys are freaks. Most, most accountants are freaks. Not freaks in, in accounting, but they're freaks when they try to apply counting as they understand it, as being a substitute for knowing the future. Now, for example, Knowing the future, what do you mean by knowing the future? We take the most important fact, kind of fact. The most important kind of fact is knowing progress, is knowing the principles of progress, of knowing the kinds of development which have opened the gates to a completely new understanding of society and civilization, which tell you that this is not going to work and therefore that's bad. But if you, if you cannot do what we must do with the population now. We must free the population from the so-called practical minds. People who are practical are useless when it comes to these matters because they are mechanical. Their thinking is mechanical. It's not productive, not creative. And the a person who wants to become something should wish to become creative. And creative means the ability to adduce from the experience that you have both as your own experience and what you know of people's experience from the past. The more people, the more you know about the history as it pertains to determining how things work, the better off you're informed. I happen to be well informed because of this stuff. There are other people who, you know, like me. We are in our, each our own way. We develop this kind of for, the ability to forecast. And there's nothing mysterious about it from our, for us. It's fascinating for us. I enjoy this thing. I enjoy discoveries for their own sake. The fact that you can now see something and discover something you couldn't understand before. And then you get to the point that you have a certain ability of certainty, that you know this is right. You know this is what the problem is. If it's not perfect, if you don't have a perfect assumption, well, here's, here are the parameters. It's either this or this or this. And that's the way it's done. But the problem is in our university programs, we have gone more and more, it's even in the secondary school, children also. We miseducate our children in our adolescence and our adults. We get them to learn rules, which means they're trying to learn the rules that are given to them and trying to hope that those rules given to them, if they accept them, are going to give them some kind of reward. And the, the fact is, the person who's going to discover is the person who does not obey the rules, it does not obey the given rules, but is trying to find for themselves what the components that lead to a future might be. And if you can do that and train yourself to do that from childhood, or if you have the gift of parents or something who do help you do that, that kind of experience, then you actually are able to think the future before it happens. Not to forecast the future, not to predict, but to think the future. I would never dare, I'd never make myself foolish enough to pretend that I had a guess, that I had a gimmick, 
If I don't know it, and if I don't know it on good grounds, I don't say I know it. I don't. And they're very, it actually, there are a limited number of times that I've done things of that sort, of that significance. But they've always worked. And as I got older, I became better at it, though a little bit slower. Okay, well, this brings our webcast for this evening to a close. I'd like to thank Mr. Lyndon LaRouche for joining us this evening. And I would encourage all of our audience to go to our website, look for the reports that Jason was discussing, um, give your money some value, and actually contribute it to us so that we can put it to work for the greater good of mankind. And in the meantime, you'll also find on the website um, orders, directions about where you can go over the course of the next two weeks to intervene on your congressman, to create that necessary pressure for them to move with the Glass-Steagall so that when they come back into session in two weeks, they know exactly what the population wants. The fire's been lit under their butt, and they'll do as is necessary and as is demanded. So you can find information on where to find your congressman or woman on our website. And so we encourage people to do that, go out, get to work, and we thank you for joining us.